it's now appropriate to hand over to the, the main reason that everybody is here, uh, which is to hear from uh, probably, I, I think, the, sort of the world expert, really, in how you assess uh, mathematics online and use uh, computers to assess mathematics. Uh, and that's Professor Chris Sangrin from the University of Edinburgh, someone that I've known for uh, 18 years now, I think, met on my very first day uh, in Birmingham and someone I've been very fortunate to work with. And I think it's brilliant to have Chris here uh, with us today, being able to share his work, his ideas, his vision, uh, because I know the systems that Chris has, has developed, he's been very, very generous in making these available freely to the sector to use. So, Chris, as always, brilliant to see you. Absolute pleasure. I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for that very kind introduction. Thank you, everybody, uh, for coming along. I'm Chris Sangman, I'm at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm going to talk today about uh, conducting fully automatically marked online exams for year one modules. So let me share my slides and we'll make a start. Uh, there we go. So in particular, uh, I want to talk about and discuss uh, running an online examination, fully automatically marked online examination for a year one introduction to linear algebra course that was sat by students in December uh, 2021. So during the first semester of this academic cycle. Um, I'm not in this talk going to talk about the importance of exams or otherwise. Um, there is a, there are two schools of thought in education. Uh, there is a traditional school that says we should have exams and then there are other people that say uh, there are other ways to assess. So I'm just not going to talk about that. And I am not going to talk either about the subject requirements of mathematics in this debate. Uh, for example, we expect similar solutions to problems uh, in a way that in an essay subject, you might not expect similar solutions. And so how that interacts with the broader debate about exams is a, is a topic I am not going to talk about at all. However, uh, this is a, a important and long-standing um, discussion. Tuki, who was president of the Mathematical Association, chose that as his subject of his uh, presidential address in 1945. He had been a teacher for 20, 127 school terms, and he, uh, <laughs> he'd been a, a chief examiner as well, and he makes some very interesting, if traditional, remarks about exams. And more broadly, Brereton's book, The Case for Examinations in 1944, is a whole discussion of examinations and their place in the educational landscape. And um, so for the curious who want to follow up those topics, there's a lot about it and that debate will, will continue, no doubt. And that's because exams matter. Um, they really matter. They matter to our students, they matter to the system. And if we replace exams with something else, projects, we talked about project marking briefly before this talk. If we, if we replace it with other things, then um, many of the issues, the difficult issues, will arise with other forms of assessment. Um, Jeffrey Housen's very famous book, a, Mathematic, uh, a, History of the Mathematical, a History of Mathematics Education in England, um, contains a really interesting discussion about how school exams have evolved and the role they play in driving education and the interface between schools and universities and how exams have uh, shaped and influenced that. And uh, as we think about our final year exams and what we're trying to achieve and um, how we mark those exams and what we look for and so on and what employers expect us to do, um, those debates are just as important at the end of university careers as they are at the uh, school university interface. Okay, so I'm not just not going to discuss any of that today. And I'm not going to talk about impersonation, plagiarism, or um, cheating, because um, it has nothing to do with mathematics, really, other than, it, you know, we expect similar solutions. So, you know, that's, that's, that's a problem for our subject. Um, I, I, I'm not going to discuss this, other than to say that it matters a lot. And it matters a lot because 99% or more of our students are decent and honest young decent and honest young people, and we have a duty of care to them. Uh, we owe them um, the care to take that seriously and to deal with it and not to turn a blind eye to it and to build systems which discourage, prevent and uh, punish uh, those people that cheat. So again, I'm not, I've got no easy answers to that. I'm not going to pretend I do. Uh, and so we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about conducting online exams. 
And I think online exams are inevitable. Um, and they're not novel. Um, in this country, Scotland, people were doing online exams in schools uh, right from the start of the century. Cliff Beavers and his group at Harriet Watt with the Pass It Project were running exams in all sorts of subjects online in classrooms. Uh, and it's quite interesting. So this isn't really very novel, actually. It, it may be novel for us individually, but it, uh, overall it's not. It's not that big a deal. Um, and so uh, why do I think they're inevitable? I think they're inevitable because young people have stopped writing. And particularly in subjects like English and, uh, and humanities, they, they don't write essays, they type them. And, and I think it will be inevitable these exams move online. Um, so I'm not advocating for online examinations at all, but I want to understand how that changes things. I want to understand what will change because uh, it changes the way you express yourself and it changes the kinds of questions we can, we can um, author and we can assess and so on. So that's really the issue. The academic, the academic integrity of our own exams from our perspective of really testing the things we want to test. Okay, so I've been conducting online uh, assessments with software called Stack, which is an online assessment system. It's a question type for mathematics. And there are lots of these online assessment systems around. Um, they've been around again for, for a very long time. Stack generates random questions. Uh, the answers contain mathematical content. So the student types in some mathematical expression. The system will establish the mathematical properties of those answers. So typically algebraic equivalence with the correct answer. Uh, and in this case, we're using Maxima behind the scenes, it's a perfectly good computer algebra system. And on the basis of those properties that you establish, um, we can give various outcomes. So formative outcomes help the students improve on the task. Summative outcomes, exactly what we do in an exam, we record their achievement. And uh, behind the scenes, there's some statistics which help us evaluate the questions. Were those questions effective in seeking to establish the properties that we, we want? So we get feedback or a score and then how we deal with those, the timing of releasing of those and what we do with those is, of course, dependent on, on the purpose of the assessment. And we talk about online exams, so there will be no feedback during the assessment and we will review everything carefully and uh, make sure that we have quality assured the marking and before we release the score to the students and kind of standard sort of thing. And Stack is software that I built. Um, and I've been working on this for nearly 20 years. Um, it's widely used and I built it because assessment is the cornerstone of effective education. We really need assessments that are worth teaching to. Um, that's a phrase that I have taken from Hugh Burkhart at the Shell Centre and Malcolm Swan at the Shell Centre in Nottingham. Assessments worth teaching to and trying to um, write assessments, good assessments, that will help our students understand the subject. And secondly, why did I write this software? Well, I think we should take responsibility for our core business. And I am nervous at, uh, it, as a, I'm nervous on behalf of the whole sector if we buy in um, third party external things. And if, we are not allowed, if we're not allowed because of licensing restrictions to adapt and improve and evaluate. Uh, so I think we really need to take responsibility for our core business. And so that's, that's what I started to do. I wrote the software and it's been uh, successful and I hope it's been useful. So I know many people will um, be familiar with Stack, um, fair enough, uh, but um, just for completeness, I'm just gonna do a quick demo. So everyone has uh, firmly in mind the kind of uh, question that I'm asking and the sorts of things that Stack can do. So I might as well just show you um, the exam. That we automated. So here is uh, my course. This is this is the course in Edinburgh. Uh, this is the really is the question that was asked. Uh, question five in the exam. Give an example of a, a non-trivial homogeneous system, ax equals b, with infinite. And uh, so it's got to be a non-trivial homogeneous system, uh, which has infinitely many solutions. So we can do one, zero, zero, uh, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. Uh, zero, it's going to be homogeneous, right? And uh, there you go. And if I if I'd done something silly, um, you know, not allowed to type in floating point numbers, so you can see there's some separation here between validity and correctness. 
Um, we've worked very hard with this to make sure students are not penalised on a technicality. And I've decided that this is a pure mass course and we're not going to have floating point numbers. Um, I mean, that's not that's not such a good example. That might be mistaking. You know, if, if you type in that, you will mistake um, 33 one hundredths for a third, which is not a third. So, you know, forbidding floating point numbers typically um, stop students being penalised on a technicality. So in this kind of situation, um, there is no feedback uh, immediately. There's no button for feedback. You just finish your attempt and then uh, the, the marks will be released later. So inside the software, what we have is, um, uh, this is a kind of correct answer, it gets one mark and I expect it to get one mark. Here, I'm checking whether it's a homogeneous system. In a homogeneous system, the right-hand side should be zero. So this test case checks that that feedback is working and it's a non-trivial non -trivial solution. So if the student just types in zero, 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 again, that's not permitted. So I'm giving them zero marks in both cases, fair enough. Uh, and what did the students do with this question? Here are some of the statistics. Um, this is just a summary of all the answers. Uh, I'm not going to go through exactly what this means, but this illustrates the marking algorithm. And this shows us how many students, 447 students came down this branch of the marking algorithm, 349 students came down this mark, branch of the marking algorithm and so on, right? And uh, these are the marks that they got and all the rest of it. Um, Surprisingly, only 52% of the students got this right. Um, 50 students did a kind of uh, sensible one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 zero. So that's kind of pretty, pretty sensible. And then you look at all the other correct things. I, I don't think the students are copying each other. They're coming up with something themselves. And these are all the things that the system judged were, were correct, right? And then of course, good, a good number of students um, forgot what a homogeneous system is. So, you know, um, Blah blah blah. Okay, so that is what we. That's what we're up to. Um, and this is the problem that, um, that I'm trying to solve. I, I've got a big first year class, like many people. Uh, we have big, big exams, um, big classes, and therefore big exams. And so in 2017, these were the papers that I had to mark before Christmas. I would acknowledge in Edinburgh, uh, we for 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 big first and second year courses for these very big courses, um, we have team marking. So my job as course organizer is to oversee the marking process, but I do get help with my marking. And I think that is a fair and reasonable way to, um, to support staff on large courses to, to offer marking support. But nevertheless, it's a big job and, um, and uh, there, there it is. So this is the course, Introduction to Linear Algebra, ILA. It's a year one, semester one, 20 credit course. So our students have 120 credits per year. We typically have more than 600 students starting the course. And in 2017, 578 took that written exam. And in that year, it was 80% exam and 20% uh, for weekly courseworks, which are, um, included some stat quizzes, but some hand-ins as well. And I think this is a fairly typical setup for a, for a first year university maths course. And not, not unreasonably, the students wanted to practice mock exam. I mean, that does seem like a reasonable request. Um, the, the practical difficulty is that in Edinburgh, we have first semester exams before Christmas. And it's not unusual for my course, because it's such a large course, to be early on in the exam period. Uh, sometimes the, the revision week ends on the Friday, and there have been years where the exam is set on the Monday. So there is absolutely no way that we can mark and return a mock exam to students, even during the revision week. That just, that just not really reasonable. Now, of course, the, with 600 students, the students have a weekly workshop of 10 to 12 students and we have a team of tutors, but some tutors do a lot and um, to, to sit a mock exam and, and give meaningful feedback would, would not really be possible, even with a team of tutors helping with the marking. So starting in 2017, quite some time ago, we, we did a, a pilot mock exam, um, uh, fully, fully online with Stack. And then we used that happily for two more years um, uh, till the pandemic came along. And, <laughs> and in 2019, um, that forced us really to do a reset exam. August 2020, the reset exam was fully online and we just used a Stack quiz. And given the state of play in, all, in the summer of 2020, with all, all that was going on in the world, um, we were generous. And our only goal really was to make sure that the students who had not passed the normal trouble-free 
December 2019 exam was to make sure that we had enough evidence to be satisfied that they could continue from year one to year two. And so we were generous and actually only 12 students took that. And I'm not going to talk about that further. But having had a, uh, some experience with the mock exam and having sat a reset, we then decided in uh, December 2020 to rearrange the course quite substantially. And the rearranging of the course was also uh, in light of confidence gained with a fully online course. So we have a first year fully online course in Edinburgh called Fundamentals of Algebra and Calculus, which predates the pandemic and was designed by George Kinnear and Richard Gratwick in Edinburgh. Uh, and I recommend if you haven't looked at that to, to go and look at that, if you're looking for fully online courses and how to run them, that's been a real success story for us. And we've gained a lot of confidence to how, in running that course as a department in how to run online courses and how to conduct them and how to assess them. And so we rearranged the introduction to linear algebra course in the summer of 2020, and we replaced the exam with a synoptic assessment. Um, which was a single final assessment. It was a timed online assessment and it contained a combination of stack questions and human marked questions. And then this year, uh, in December 2021, we continued that stack, that synoptic assessment. But this year, as an experiment, we, um, we made it stack only. So the goal of this experiment was to look at the extent to which we could design a final fully automatically marked online assessment um, where we are asking questions which test the students where I'm satisfied that I think we are properly assessing the course outcomes. Um, so let's look at the mock assessment first. Um, this was a practice exam for sure, uh, but it was likely to be taken seriously by the students because they'd asked for it. And the fact that there was no contribution to the grade probably means there's no incentive to cheat. And in Edinburgh for many years, we've had open book exams, right? The written, the written exam is open book, even in a, an invigilated setting, which we've, we've had up until the last two years, we've had an invigilated setting. You can bring in textbooks, past exam papers and any notes you can reasonably fit on your exam desk, right? So um, we, we've had open book exams for a very long time. And um, uh, one thing that's been interesting over the last two years is the difficulty it's been in separating out the various issues associated with exams. So there's take home exams, there's open book exams and so on. And these are, these are separate issues. And since we had open book exams for, for a long time, we weren't really concerned that the practice exam would be, um, would, would be done under radically different conditions than the, the invigilated exam. And especially since there was really no incentive to cheat. Um, and what we did in 2017 is we took the oldest two past papers that we had available. And we looked at the questions that we had already asked in the past and we implemented as many of those as, uh, as possible. We, we looked at as many questions as we could. How many of those questions could be implemented in stack exactly as they were on paper? So what do I mean by that? Um, the, the marks awarded by the system should be given in exactly the same way as the marks awarded by a human examiner. So to what extent could we automate our previous exams? That was, the, that was what we set out to think about in 2017. Now, of course, there's the justification versus the answer. And in the University of Mathematics course, it's about reasoning as much as the answer. So um, you know, that's a serious problem, and we didn't expect to be able to fully uh, implement a traditional exam online. I mean, that would be completely ridiculous. Um, so what do we do about this justification? The answer, well, here is a question that was on one of those past papers. Is it possible for A and B to be three by three ranked two matrices with uh, A, B equals zero? True or false, right? So um, these true or false questions on our exams require justification. And on the paper exam, there were seven marks for the answer and justification. Well, when you translate that to an online exam, you get one mark for the answer, which is you know, pretty much, you know, it says with justification, but actually when we're marking exams, um, an exam question like this, we would probably award one mark for the right answer, whether or not there was any uh, meaningful justification. I mean, that's just, that's just what we do. Um, and I think that's right. So if we're going to translate that online, we can only actually automate one mark out of seven here. Um, that's, that's what I mean by marking, uh, that's what I mean by automating the exam, uh, awarding the marks in precisely the same way as, um, 
as one would on paper. So in addition to this automatic assessment for the mock exam, students could provide typed free text justifications. So um, next to the true false question on the, in the online exam, we would say, you know, explain why. Now we said to the students that the, the, these, these would, would not be marked and they would get no feedback. And in fact, no one would even read them. And that might feel a bit strange, but I think um, there's good evidence that um, practicing something like this, in bringing these things to mind, practicing working under pressure uh, has some benefit to the student. And the student can certainly read the work solutions to these after they've done the mock exam and look at their solution versus the work solution. And then they could talk to their friends and they could talk to their tutor about the mock exam. Um, although uh, sadly that was rarely, we rarely got queries about that. Um, but they were certainly uh, welcome to contact their tutors. And, um, and I was surprised at the extent to which the students would actually type justifications, knowing that nobody, uh, no, nobody apart from themselves would ever, would ever look at these things. So there were 240 marks available on the December 2011 and August 2012 papers, the oldest two papers I had available uh, as past papers. And it's 240 marks because we had a section B where there were four 20 mark questions and it was the best three out of four counted. So our exams had 120 marks available on them. And of those marks, 45% uh, we could automate, um, which I have to say <laughs> um, was surprisingly high. Uh, and um, I think says a lot about the nature of the questions that we ask. So we ask things that the computer can mark. Uh, we ask for mechanical processes, solving equations, and we award marks for the accuracy of those answers. So that means that we can, uh, we could, we could easily. Oh, I would also say I don't think my course is out of line either with other courses in Edinburgh or courses at other institutions where I've worked or other other institutions where I've looked at their exams. So uh, if you think that's high for a first year course then um, and we can talk about that have a look at your own courses and see what marks are really awarded for <laughs> um, one of one of my constant experiences with trying to put assessments online as i said at the beginning of this talk to understand the process of assessment uh, is to understand the process of assessment through automation and you know when you're actually confronted with the fact that 45 percent of the marks for your questions are for entirely mechanical processes that's a slightly sobering moment when you reflect on what you're what you're really doing. Anyway, uh, that does mean I had a, a, a had a hundred uh, more than a hundred marks from which I could create a quite decent mock exam. Uh, and bear in mind that a lot of these questions came with justify your answers, so the mock exam actually had significantly more than we would expect the students to do in a in a, in a traditional exam. But little partial credit here, right? The mock exam didn't have a lot of partial credits in it. That's more complicated to automate. And so there were, you know, there, we, did, we didn't do too much of that in the mock exam. Um, a good proportion of the students took the mock exam. Two thirds of the students took the mock exam. There were no technical problems. Uh, the mean mark was 48% uh, standard deviation. It correlated well with the um, uh, so come back to Alpha. There was good internal consistency on the on the on the questions that we were asking. Uh, the, the the exam grades were moderately correlated with the real exam. I mean, nothing stunning there. Uh, that that's what it looks like. Um, that is the that's the um, the score on the exam paper against the score on the online exam um, with the best fit line. What I think the big surprise from the mock exam was, is that students typed quite a lot, right? So these are um, the number of students who typed in justifications. So students, even though they knew no one would ever read these, half the students are basically typing in something in the exam. And M is the number of characters. I just counted the number of characters, right? So there's quite a large standard deviation on, on these um, character counts. So there's a, there's a big variation in how much students are typing, but they are typing stuff. And if you go and look at it, it's all very sensible. Um, and it's, it's free text, it's just using the, the Moodle text editor. We did nothing fancy. Students basically type in some pidgin LaTeX um, or some kind of uh, maths, informal maths, just typed. Um, perfectly understandable, perfectly intelligible. 
And this whole process of, uh, of doing the mock exam and, and reading the typed uh, expressions did give me confidence that were we to do this, it would be a reasonable thing to do. I mean, it's quite a long time ago now, it's five years ago. And thinking back five years ago, I don't think we really envisaged that students would photograph and upload uh, work in the way that we're now used to accepting over the last two years. So this was an experiment on a number of levels. Um, it was a modest success, no technical problems, mean scores were lower, um, no partial credit. Um, we didn't really assess the student's justification and we didn't really um, worry too much about the time it took them to write these. And we experimented with, with typing and I, 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 yeah, uh, now I think students are happy with photos and uploading. We, we did allow them the option to do that, but mostly the students just typed into an, in, in the mock exam. We'll come back to that. And then COVID came along. So in, in 2020 to 21, um, we, we developed this online synoptic assessment. Um, so the previous year, we'd got up to 650 students and the exam scripts took 35 person days to mark. And I've been keeping records on this because we, we have to, um, we have to uh, invite colleagues to help with the marking and we use some postgraduate students to help with the marking. Uh, uh, and we supervise those carefully. And so we keep a track of how many person days it takes to deal with the exam. And that works out at about 22 minutes per script. The numbers have increased. I think that's uh, probably true broadly across the sector. The numbers of undergraduates have increased. And in the 2020 to 21 stack and human marking, um, we had uh, 718 students that year take the test. And that took 22 person days. So this combination of automatically assessing and, um, and human marking has reduced significantly the amount of human time it takes to deal with each script. So that is a substantial saving of staff time. Um, and then uh, this year, it took me two days to carefully review every typed answer um, and to add some partial credit and to uh, deal with the fully automatically marked quizzes. Uh, of course, all the effort is front loaded. Um, you have to write the stack quizzes and then you have to do the all on online assessment. And that, that takes a significant amount of time, much longer, I think, um, than just writing an exam. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. That's something I want to discuss in a bit more detail. But there is a substantial staff saving here of around 50 person days. I think if we go to 22 minutes per script, we've got a lot more, a lot more students, um, 45 to 50 days to, to deal with the exam in a traditional way. So the two days of dealing with that is for checking and awarding some partial credit for anticipated responses. So the advantage of not releasing immediate feedback and uh, well, it's an exam, um, so, well, it's not an exam, it's a synoptic assessment, but it replaced the exam. And so the, the whole uh, synoptic assessment mark was then bundled with the coursework mark and approved by the exam board and is not released until the, uh, ex the exam board is, is takes place in January. So there was plenty of time to actually review and quality assure the automatic marking, which needs to be done. There are an unanticipated responses uh, that, that you want to um, accept or reject and you might want to add some partial credit into these questions and, and having an opportunity to do that before the students get the marks, um, uh, it really helps. So in 2020 to 21, we had this online final test that was a combination of stack questions and human marking. And we had, again, we had a combination of typing and uploading photos uh, and mostly the students took photos this time. I think the, nearly every student has a smartphone. The students were expecting to photograph and upload their work. We gave them opportunities to practice. We briefed them on that and, um, and, and the students took photos and, and entered them into the computer. So here is a, this is a question from the 2020 to 21 stack human marking question. Find the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvalues. Right, so this is this. The, it's no surprise, and I'm very happy to record in a in a talk that will be on YouTube. It is no surprise that this question comes up most years because whether students can calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors is a key learning outcome in the course, and we're probably going to assess it in some way or other uh, nearly every year. <laughs> so you know, calculate the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors. Uh, so Stack can perfectly well establish that. 
um, it, the, the system does this by actually multiplying what the student claims is an eigenvector by the matrix and then making sure that the uh, result is the eigenvalue multiplied by the eigenvector. So we're not looking for a particular eigenvector, we're just making sure we have a non-zero vector that satisfies the particular property. And then I can't remember whether the eigenvalues here are distinct or you know all those other things that you want, right? Um, and then in, in parallel with that, the students had to uh, upload a full working to this question and, uh, and we marked that by hand. And, and actually, um, yeah, I'll come back to that. Here is a fully uh, a typical human marked question. Um, it's a bit small. So write an arbitrary two by two um, matrix um, in this way by direct calculation on A show that A has trace K and determine at zero when A squared equals KA, right? So blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, we told them it was A, B, C, D so we can mark with partial credit more easily. Yeah, write, this, write the matrix in this way and then by direct calculation on A show this is true. And then some other stuff, right? And then assume that X and Y are column vectors of length N and X transpose X equals K, proving using matrix algebra that this, so. so this is a typical exam question and we've just expected the students to type or upload. And actually mostly the students just wrote and uploaded, almost nobody typed. With follow-up, um, and so we'd had a combination here the other way around where there was a, a, a written question first and then a stack follow-up find a three by three matrix A containing no zero entries at all for which A squared is the zero matrix, right? So uh, A squared is KA. So uh, if you've done one to three, this should be a bit of a hint, choose K equals zero. So we just need two vectors, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you get the idea. Now this of course is a question that we would never ask on a mark. You know, if I had 850 of these to do, I mean, it would just be an utterly miserable dark December, wouldn't it, to, to sit and try and, square 850 mate, three by three matrices. Why, why on earth would I do that? So I would never ask this question on a traditional exam, but we, we could and we did. And, um, and I think that tested whether students could apply what they'd just done in this previous, previous three parts. Okay. Um, this was the results of the 2020, perfectly respectable looking results from a, from a final um, undergraduate test. We, Maybe want the mean a little bit higher, perhaps 65%, but I think that was perfectly respectable. Function very well. Um, and what I think we appreciated when we came to marking was the separation of accuracy from method. Um, so looking at that, that first question, did they calculate the correct eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors? Well, Stack is sorting that out. Stack is making sure that they've got the correct eigenvalues and eigenvectors. All the human is really trying to do is to decide, am I confident that this person, the student, am I confident that the student knows how to calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors, right? The human marker doesn't have to do the follow through marking. They don't have to check the accuracy results. Yes, the student may have calculated the wrong root of the cubic or whatever. Um, well, uh, you don't, then don't have to follow that through, right? I mean, stack is, we have separated our accuracy from method and that made it easier and much more pleasurable to mark, not having to, to do these two things. Um, I, I mean, I, I try hard, but it is frustrating when students make lots of repeated um, arithmetic errors and that taints your judgment of whether you think they understand the method, right? It just does. Uh, and so it was just easier to look at what the student had written and think, am I confident this person understands how to do this? That's liberating. So there's definitely some benefit to this. Okay, so this year we uh, experimented with a fully automatically marked test. Um, a mix of calculations and these conceptual true false multiple choice questions that um, like that, the very first one I showed you was seven marks. And then we had some other things. We had these kinds of give examples questions. Um, the, the, the stack demo of the homogeneous system was, was one of those. And some proof related questions, which I'll talk about in a moment. So here's the give me example questions, a static slide of exactly the same thing I've uh, just shown you. And the proof were proof comprehensions. So proof comprehension is when we ask students about a proof. Um, rather than asking them to write a proof. And I think it turns out to be quite hard to write these questions. 
This is something I've um, turned my attention to in the last two or three years. Uh, and it's tricky. It's very tricky to write these proof comprehension questions. Uh, they end up being a, a combination of multiple choice and stack. Um, so both of, both of these input formats have their place here. Um, and this story started in 2019, um, Dr. Bickerton, Robbie Bickerton, uh, who's also now a, a member of staff in Edinburgh. We started thinking about this in 2019 and we had started writing a paper, which we published very quickly around April 2020, just as the pandemic came out. Uh, and everyone was moving things online. And as part of this, we, we wrote what we call this proof understanding baseline checklist. And this is a set of prompts, which I found very useful when I'm trying to decide what I want to ask students about a proof. So this checklist enables me to write questions about proofs. So which formal definitions, which notation are relevant to the proof, right? Do the students understand the definitions? Uh, can you describe the modular structure of the proof? So um, uh, if it's a, a proof by exhaustive cases, are all the cases there and where are those cases? If it's an if and only if proof, where are the different directions proved? Uh, where are the hypotheses used? Uh, it, which examples do and do not satisfy the hypotheses? Um, you know, if there's more than one hypothesis for a theorem, uh, do we have examples that satisfy every combination? And what happens if you have an example that doesn't satisfy one of the hypotheses? Where does the proof break? And all this kind of stuff. So this checklist was something that we wrote to try and help us um, uh, write questions, proof comprehension questions. And this is one of the proof comprehension questions from the, um, from the online exam. Um, we've got three linearly independent vectors, then the, the, the span, these two spans are the same. Um, so we define W to be the span of X plus Y, Y plus Z and Z plus X, and U to be the span of X, Y, Z, and, a, and then the student has to fill in the gaps, right? Now, I would typically use something like this in a formative setting because students don't understand the difference between set membership and subset, right? Um, but we, we, we put this on the exam um, and, um, yeah, it's a little bit sobering. There uh, still seem to be students who don't understand the difference between set membership and subset, and who don't read things carefully. <laughs> um, so this was not a trivial question, um, disappointingly. Uh, there is some real work to do here, right? I mean, one direction is trivial, you just expand out the brackets. The other direction, uh, there is some work to do, and this is where the stack inputs come in. Can you actually show that, um, uh, we have, uh, we have these coefficients. So that's what we mean by a kind of proof comprehension. This is a kind of filling in the gaps proof. And then we have proof comprehension, which is about the proof. So at one point in the proof, we assume that there are these three vectors. May we assume that A, B, C are not all zero? Well, why did I phrase it like that? Well, not all zero is basically to do with linear independence, whereas this question is about spans. So I'm trying to, to, to understand I'm trying to test whether the students understand are attuned to the difference between working with linear independence and working with spans. So that's what that, that question was all about. And um, uh, dimension, yeah, something about dimension. So there are three vectors and they're linearly independent. So uh, it's got to be at least a three dimensional space. Uh, and then there were some questions that we couldn't ask, you know, I mean, where is the linear independence actually used? I mean, I, I added linear independence, so I could, uh, I, could, um, I could ask this follow up question. I mean, is linear independence actually used in the proof? Uh, and if not, uh, is the theorem true for any vectors, right? I mean, and so on. So there are some things that we, we couldn't ask and automatically assess that I would have wanted to for this kind of question. Oh, and I should say for fairness, this is this kind of question um, there are many ways to ask a question like this, and this is not the first time they, the, the question asking students to determine if two spans are the same uh, has, uh, has occurred on the, on the exam. So if you haven't seen this kind of question before, there are many variations where they are and are not equal for a variety of interesting different reasons. So this, this is, should not be a massive surprise in context of the, um, the corpus of previous exam papers for this course. 
Okay, so here are the results, 2021, December 2021 results. Yeah, I mean, it's a slightly higher mean standard deviation. We, you know, we were, we were generous. I think we needed one more proof comprehension question and uh, uh, some fewer predictable calculations, basically. Um, but that was kind of, that's okay. I don't, I don't feel too badly about that. We certainly didn't scale it. Uh, oh, that's a spelling mistake there, okay. I think that uh, behind all of this, writing good questions lies at the core of this and writing questions which adapt to the format, right? So there are constraints online that we're not used to in paper, right? I mean, uh, writing proof comprehension questions is perfectly possible and that adapts to the format, right? Um, but they're difficult and I, I find them difficult. I haven't written enough of them. I haven't spent enough time thinking about that, uh, but I think it deserves more attention. It deserves more attention online or in paper. There's some very interesting proof comprehension questions that you could put on a paper-based exam. Um, they would, yeah, they would, would not be out of place. And the give examples questions definitely have a valuable place, but I'm certainly not going to go back and put those on a paper exam when I've got 850 to mark. I mean, that would be awful. And let me just say for the record that I think a good question is one which differentiates between someone who understands the subject and someone who does not. That's what I mean by, by a good question. So in conclusion, it has taken us years to gain confidence. We started five years ago with a pilot online exam and that pilot online exam went hand in hand with a serious attempt to evaluate and consider what questions we could mark exactly online, right? So we started with the traditional questions we were all happy with. But that said, the questions need to be designed for the format and that format is different, right? Stack and computer aided assessment more generally are different. I think writing proof comprehension is difficult uh, and I am developing uh, my style and some confidence in doing that. But any change, we're, you know, changing things is tricky. So yeah, we have to invest some time and we'd be delighted to talk with other people about how we can design these, um, these kinds of questions. I think we wrote a decent synoptic assessment, but important things cannot be assessed. So currently the synoptic assessment is 50% of the marks for the course. It's gone down from 80 to 50. Uh, and we have upped the coursework component and that includes the student's ability to write free form proofs. So some of the things that we could not assess in the synoptic assessment, uh, there's now more emphasis on those assessments in the coursework rather than in the exam. So I think we're still covering those things as the overall assessment for the module. We're just not assessing them in the online exam. So we could write a fully online exams, and I think we could do that more generally, particularly for the methods-based courses in earlier years. Um, but I think the semi-automatic approach is a sensible compromise, and I think that will give us a better coverage of the learning outcomes. And that's probably what we'll go back to for the next semester when we have a, a fully online exam, but it won't be all fully automatically marked. We will go back and devote some staff time to marking students' written work that they upload during the exam. And um, that seems like a good, good place to stop. So thank you. There's applause there. Um, I'm not sure who's going to be doing um, wrangling the questions, but I'm sure if I just step in and say, well, thanks very much, Chris, for that. You know, really thought provoking um talk um I've, I've got quite a few notes here that i'll be looking at later um so i'll give people a chance to um put some questions in the chat and i, I should say during lockdown we you did actually do quite a few talks for for um about stack so i'll, I'll put a link for that in the uh, in the chat when I've got got a chance. So if you want to ask a question, um, you can see in the chat, you can also stick your hand up and uh, ask the question by turning on your microphone when we when we ask you to, to do so. So there are some questions in the chat, Kevin. Andrew Burbanks has asked, could you number the question steps and then ask on which step is linearly independence used? Right, now, this is a big surprise, is quite how difficult that is to do. And it's difficult for two reasons. Uh, sometimes there's genuine ambiguity about what used means. And often it's going from one step to another. So if you've taken a, you know, if you've used linear independence to get from step five to step six, is that five or is it six? So 
uh, uh, try it, Andrew, try it and uh, try it for yourself because Robbie and I were surprised at the, at the difficulty of writing unambiguous questions of precisely that type. Now that could easily be my failing. It could easily be my lack of imagination or, or whatever. Um, so try these things out for yourselves, but just, um, yeah, be careful. Um, also interesting things about, term, you know, again, this, this ob objectivity of the online assessment really highlights ambiguity in what we do every day. So we, uh, I'm, I'm teaching proofs and problem solving in the second semester and we teach proof by induction. Where is the induction hypothesis used, right? That was exactly the kind of question we were trying. But what is the induction hypothesis and what does it mean to use it? Uh, is it? Is it really the thing that you take as the hypothesis of the induction step or is it the statement? Different books use different phrases and they use them in different ways and sometimes they're contradictory. It's really fascinating. Um, uh, if and only if, some areas of philosophy use only if to mean if. Whereas if you say if and only if, the if direction and the only if direction, but the, if you're saying only if, A only if B is A implies B, right? I mean, that <laughs> it's funny, it's very funny. Right, we do have a hand up, Richard Mycroft. Uh, do you wanna ask that personally, Richard? Hi, uh, thanks, hi Chris. Uh, Nice to see you again. Sorry, I don't have my camera, so I can't turn it on. Um, thank you for the talk. I just wanted to ask if you have any concerns with these online assessments about what I worry is a concern, which is that my feeling is students really like the feeling that of kind of significant individual attention on their work. And I, I appreciate you've got things like the review of the uh, free, the the. The, the, they can write comments and you have that, but it it still, I think, feels more impersonal than actually writing on paper and having kind of written comments on your work. And this fits, I, I mean, I have some wider concerns about the the way that yep. the student experience seems to be becoming depersonalized in many ways and what this isn't the direction we want to go in. So do, do you think this is an issue? Right. Um, thanks for raising that. I do think it's a big issue. Now, um, Personal attention, paying attention to people really matters. It does, it really matters. And it's important that we pay attention to students. We put a huge effort into the workshops so that the students get to know their tutor and that we pay them proper attention. And the tutor sits down and, you know, you handed in this work and we're gonna talk through it, right? And that, that's what we do. I mean, my question to everyone here is how much individual attention do you actually pay to a script when you're marking a traditional exam? Let's be serious about that. I mean, really? So the students might feel that, but what is the reality? And a second point there, Richard, is the consistency of marking. You know, I know, and I'm still being recorded, I know from my own personal experience in the run up to lunch when I'm tired, uh, you know, I'm probably not uh, quite the same as I am when I'm arrived at nine o'clock in the morning, bright and keen to mark the exams. That is the nature of human endeavor, uh, uh, especially with the subjectivity that goes even on exam scripts. Right. I mean, yes, if I'm marking, have they got the right eigenvalues? That's objective and easy to mark by hand. But when I'm deciding on the quality of a student's proof written under exam conditions, that is subjective. Um, so, yes, Richard, I am very concerned about the depersonalization that has gone hand in hand with the, with the, with the, the increase in, in numbers. Right? I, I have a sea of faces and I get to know very few of them. And I'm very sad about that. Um, yeah, so there's actually quite a lot of separate, I think in, in response to what you've said, there are quite a lot of separate issues there. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next question was going to be from Derek Harland in the chat, but he's, he's got his hand up as well. So Derek's one of my colleagues at, uh, at Leeds. So Derek, do you want to ask, ask away, please? Yeah, it is the same question. I just thought I'd be, be a bit more pushy. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, th thanks, Chris. That, that was, so we you, you said at the start of the talk, you, you sort of weren't talking much about academic integrity. When we have designed uh, electronic assessments and exams, the high stakes assessment in Leeds, that's been the main thing that, that yeah, we yeah. worried about. So what, what I mean, maybe you, you had the students in, in a in visual. No, no. We, they're at home. We don't know where they are. Okay. Uh, uh, they're not invigilated. So they are not invigilated. 
Um, and I do know that some students cheat. They do. And we have evidence that some students cheat, right? I mean, I'm being mm. recorded and I won't say any more about that. I'm not, you know, I'm not blind to that. Certainly in 2020, and uh, we have um, rightly uh, concentrated on the academic side of things, and we have not, uh, we have we turned a blind eye to uh, the, um, the need to invigilate. That's not a sustainable position, right? And we will be going back to invigilation, I think. But that doesn't mean that you can't, I mean, I think what I think will happen is that people will bring their laptops into an exam room. And that's what I think will happen. And there's a lot of agitation for that in the arts because the students just physically can't hold a pen for three hours anymore, right? I mean, they're just, they're just not practiced at it. They don't need to do it ever. And the business world is not gonna have them sat at the desk writing, is it? I mean, it's crazy. So we have to separate out the issues. One is invigilation and one is online. And I want to focus today on the online assessment and the kinds of questions that we ask to try and decide if students understand the subject. I mean, you've broken ranks here and asked the invigilation question, which is fair enough, but our students were not invigilated and we kind of just accepted that. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the question is, did, did that constrain your question design? I mean, you, a little bit, I mean, a little bit. So the create examples questions um, do require the students, you know, there's opportunities there for genuinely different things. And there, I mean, I, there was one. There was one response that I would not have thought was a kind of minimal, sensible response, or it wasn't just typing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine into the matrix or something. Right? There was a weird response from a lot of students uh, to one of the create examples questions, and then I cross-referenced those students with their answers to the other create examples questions, and there was no pattern. Right? So I don't think there was a little group of students getting together and all doing it in a, in a kind of WhatsApp group, right? Which is the kind of risk. So yeah, that's the sort of thing we did where there's evidence that they're doing their own thing. Um, but it's difficult. And if anyone has um, ex more experience of this or suggestions, then it would be very valuable to know what they are. But I don't pretend to know that. I think we need invigilation. Right, okay, th th thanks for that. Uh... Uh, Derek, um, I've, I've, the next question up in the chat is from another one of my colleagues. So uh, shall I quickly ask that? I know we're running out of time here. So uh, do you feel the students were prepared for the proof comprehension questions since the coursework questions were probably different? Yeah, and that's a very good question. I mean, one of the things that Robbie and I have been trying to do is to write proof comprehension questions every week in the formative online quizzes. Right. I mean, that, that's exactly what we've been doing. So I think in context that, yes, they were. But that's because we made sure. I mean, you're right. You're raising a very important question here. And that is that the exam is not the place to surprise the students, is it? I mean, that's that's, that's not fair. And that's not what we want. I mean, the, the exam should, in some sense, be dull and predictable in certain ways. Um, and, I, and I think we did that. Mm. OK, I, I think we've got enough time to, to answer this next question. Um, how accessible to students with disabilities or additional needs is STAC? Um, we've done our best. And one of the advantages of going in with Moodle is that Moodle already has a lot of accessibility features. I think in some ways it's much more accessible. And that's thanks to the Open University. I would record my thanks to them because we've received advice from the OU on how to, how to deal with those kinds of issues. Um, but students can resize the browser, um, they can use their normal accessibility features, and this is something we're constantly trying to improve. And any suggestions as, as we develop our understanding of that um, uh, would, would be gratefully received. The, the stack is part of Moodle, and Moodle already has lots of features for giving individuals extra time or second attempts or all, a whole range of things. I think the, the uh, range of editors, and the ability to upload or type. I mean, all of these things uh, give the individual choice uh, in how they view the script and how they respond. And that is usually aligned with good practice and accessibility, as I understand it. No right. doubt you could do better. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I think we've come to, to the end of time here. So, I mean, unless you're, there's any questions there that you particularly thought, oh, I'll definitely want to answer that before I go, or if there's anything you want to say to, to kind of sum up. Um. No, I'm happy to stop. I, I, yeah, let's stop here and we can, uh, I'm happy to um, continue to take questions informally, but let's, let's finish on time.
Right. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Can, can we all uh, a round of applause here? I think, um, I think the un, the OU unmute and applause. I think is is what we normally do here, or should adopt here, Kevin. Right. Unmute and then make a <laughs> make, make something that the um... another example of practice shamelessly stolen from the Open University. There. <laughs> well, why not? Yes. So. Um... So, Chris, you're just uh, you're just saying that you, you you can hang around to to answer some of the questions here. Yes, um, is is that what you intended? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm happy to do that. I, I lost my place in the in the questions. Oh, yeah. Oop. Somebody there. Um, so there was there was one that was what choices did the students have for the signs in the proof comprehension question? Yeah, so how many sort of choices do they get usually? I mean, is it like a whole stack and there's there's one that's not obvious, there's one that's obviously wrong and that sort of thing. In It's like a multiple choice, yes? Uh, let me find it. Shall I just show you what we do? So this was a different one. I mean, this is a kind of which dot product rules make the proof work. Um, so, you know, u dot v is v dot u. So using the rule number, justify each line. Um, so there's that kind of thing. There was always, sometimes, never. Where is that other proof? Are we seeing so, the, I'm seeing a tech script here. Is oh, I see my slide tech. That's, that is embarrassingly incompetent, isn't it? Uh, that was the tech, the script it's screen two that I wanted. Okay, sorry. If only we had a competent tech person here. Is that working? Not yet. Uh, Don't see anything being shared. Right, yes, yeah, so you can see that you can preview this quiz. Oh, yeah, sorry, that says. <laughs> well, this, yeah, is the, uh, this is that that question so you know there are a whole range of plausible kind of symbols right but the most likely one would have been the the, the one in the um subset equals yeah i mean let's see what they did I mean, if you want to see what they did um, i can't remember how i authored this now that was the first one probably let's see so here we go. So zero is subset, right? Zero is um, element of, and three is subset. So let's have a look and see what they did. Um, yeah, so 20% of the students got that first part wrong. Um, Was it aren't one? I can't remember which part of the problem is part of the it was aren't one. Okay. Right. So 16% of the students put subset rather than um, element of, right? Yeah. Even though it wasn't, even though it wasn't the you know the first thing on the drop down, they've actively chosen that. So it was not a trivial question, right? I mean, it was supposed to be a bit of a gift. That's okay on the exam to have a few of those. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't a trivial, it wasn't completely trivial. Right, so it, it, I, mean, I was gonna say, what I think we should do is, I think we, we've had Chris's time for an hour and Chris is probably wanting a cup of tea or, or, <laughs> or something similar. So I, I, Chris, I, are you happy if anyone's got particular things that they want to pick up offline, they drop you an email? Um, is, that, is, that, is that okay? Well, absolutely, yeah. And I, I would really value some discussion um, from other people. And this, the, uh, I'm in this for the long term, for sure. You know, the, the, the practice quiz was, the practice mock exam has been around. This, we've used it five years now. So, uh, and I think we're going to carry on with this kind of thing. And it would be interesting to see what other people are doing and what their views are. And then uh, I would be interested to, um, if someone else would like to run a talk on dealing with some of these more difficult issues, because that matters to all of us. The, the integrity of what we do matters. So I hope we can continue this, but yeah. 
Well, and Chris, you always have a, an open invitation to, uh, to to come back to to Talmo, and uh, and thanks for not sitting on the fence with any of the answers to the questions today. Uh, I think uh, it, it's always great to get your your sort of honest and uh, and frank views on a on, on a complete you know range of range of issues. But I think you know you really are sort of pushing this forward for the sector, and I think we should all be very grateful for the the tools that you and and a number of other colleagues have well have worked to to, to develop. Um, and made so generously and freely available. So I think uh, a big thank you to not just for today, but I think for everything that you've you've done for the community over the last sort of 20 or so years, believe it or not. Um, thank you.